Okay, yeah, thank you, and and thank you for having me out to give the give the talk. So I'm going to present some uh, joint work with uh, grad student work with Christian Fong. Um, but really, this this work begins, I think, exactly where where Duncan wants us to begin with a basic core problem, and I think it's a basic core problem that political scientists think about a lot. And what we're going to think about to drill it down to its most basic element is how do people, things, elements, uh, folks out there in the world respond to text or speeches that are given? And just to give you a sense about how general this problem might be, consider some contemporary things that are happening in the world. For example, uh, in the United States, we have a long and persistent concern with how the public's going to respond to, to demagogues, to populists, people who are making appeals that have perhaps little, little to do with what government could actually do. This is actually a, a certain kind of appeal that's, I mean, a certain concern that's true across the world. The sort of demago uh, the appeal of demagogues and why they're so uh, appealing to the public is a big and persistent concern. But within government, we also might be interested in well, as well as how elected officials can persuade the public to enact reforms that could perhaps be in the public's best interest, or worse yet, how elected officials could pander to the public and make certain kinds of appeals that dupe the public into adopting a policy that on its face seems great, but at the end of the day results in everybody having to pay a, a large amount of money for some gold star plan they didn't want anyways. Um, we also, in a campaign season, will hear people breathlessly commenting to us on the radio and on television about the sort of concerns about uh, uh, televised ads and how televised ads are uh, making the, the public much more polarized and how these televised ads are appealing to the public and really undermining what should otherwise be a very sober discussion about what's going on uh, in, in this campaign. Okay, and in my own work, I've thought a lot about how text might uh, relate to how people respond. So here we see Richard Shelby. He's a Republican senator from Alabama. He's uh, breaking ground at the Shelby Hall for Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Alabama. It is not so named because Richard Shelby happens to be a rich man who has donated lots of money to the state system, but rather because Richard Shelby has perhaps been so successful at steering money to the state of Alabama. And indeed, in uh, extended uh, projects with Sean Westwood and Solomon Messing, we examine exactly this sort of dynamic. How is it that the public learns about things that their members of Congress do? And in this case, how is it that the public learns about um, how members of Congress direct money back to the district? And what we find by analyzing a really large collection of, of texts that uh, we gathered from members of Congress is that politicians create what we call an impression of influence. It isn't as if politicians only talk about the things that they've directly secured to their district. And it isn't as if most of government spending happens through earmarks, which we used to hear a lot about. about. In fact, what we find by analyzing this large collection of politicians' statements is that politicians tend to claim credit for relatively small grants. The modal dollar amount claimed for by a member of Congress is something on the order of $100,000. And that members of Congress regularly claim credit for things they had little influence uh, securing. In fact, the single thing that's most discussed in a credit claiming press release, when members of Congress are making the case they deserve money for their district, is about fire department grants. So these are small grants allocated to a small town. It's about $15,000 on order of that amount uh, that members of Congress claim credit for. So having then studied in depth what members of Congress claim credit for, we also wanted to get an impression, also wanted to better understand how voters react to these credit claims. So what we did is we did many what would look like a traditional experiment. So we went out, we studied a lot of these statements. We could now go down, we could manipulate facets of these texts. We could put that in front of uh, people in a variety of contexts, including in survey experiments. We developed a Facebook application to manipulate the content there and actually delivered some treatments over email. And what we found is that people tended to make an inference about these, about what their member of Congress was doing based on the type of thing the member of Congress was securing or the action that was reported rather than the amount of money secured. So for example, in one experiment, we showed that voters are much more responsive to the number of actions that their member of Congress reports rather than the amount of money that's secured, even though the amount of money that we were comparing in that condition was something on the order of 100 times more than the actions. So voters were very responsive to actions, not money. And voters are also much more responsive to the type of grant rather than the amount of money that the member of Congress secured. And so this would suggest, perhaps, if we were sitting here and we were thinking, okay, we're going to be problem-oriented, the problem that we want to understand is accountability. And what we think that people want 
is to get more money to their district, this perhaps then we have a natural solution here. We should intervene and we should tell people about this particular system. One of the interesting things I think that happens when we take a step back and we identify a pattern like this and think through what are the implications of this pattern is that that might be exactly the wrong conclusion. So what we find here is that this system is set up in a way that rewards members of Congress for securing things like competitive grants, grants that are allocated not by political discretion, but rather by a sort of team of experts who assess the viability of certain kinds of projects. What you might be concerned with with any competitive grant process is that it's not very politically robust. If you're a member of Congress and you want to cut something, uh, cut funding, you're not going to do the thing that allows you to direct money to your district, perhaps. You would cut the thing that you have very little control over. So, so it would be fragile, except in the instance where this political institution creates opportunities for members of Congress to claim credit for the spending. And that's exactly what we show happens. Members of Congress are able to uh, claim credit for spending that comes out of these competitive programs that makes these competitive programs politically robust and perhaps explains why they're able to persist. Indeed, we show that some floor votes that members of Congress take are related to their regular use of these sorts of grants. And so here we have perhaps some notion that we're studying accountability, and we have a particular workflow as well that seems like it would be a useful workflow. We're going to study the text first, and then we're going to look, based on the things we identify in the text, we'll make some manipulations in the text and a view response. Okay, but this also suggests then that as the researcher, we're putting a lot of priority on our own intuition at this stage right here. What we're saying is that we're able, through whatever tools we might be able to use, whatever fancy statistical uh, tools we can use, that we as the researcher can identify the facets of the text that we're most interested in and then manipulate those. And perhaps we think that we could bake into the research process some discovery. And that's what I'm going to show you an example of today using the running example of candidate biographies. This is yet another problem that perhaps is persistent in this particular election, but also came up a lot in the 2008 and 2012 uh, campaigns. There's going to be features of who the candidate is, whether it's their gender, their race, or perhaps their background, for example, serving in the military, like John McCain is here, that could lead voters to be more likely to vote for that particular candidate. And so the question we might be interested in, what are the features of candidates that lead voters to like or dislike that candidate more? And then how could we think about some engineering to think about pointing out these biases that voters might have or the implication these biases might have for whatever political system we're interested in? So across these examples then, what we're interested in is the causal effect of some text. We want to perform some manipulation in a text, and we want to assess how that manipulation affects some reaction later on. And what I'm going to suggest today is that we're going to be able to think about discovering a, the causal effect of text. In particular, discovering the things that we might want to manipulate and then the effects of those manipulations. And so I'm going to make a distinction that's, I think, common across many other types of um, uh, statistical procedures. So we have what I think would traditionally be confirmatory experiments. We have some manipulation that we want to do. We want to confirm that some manipulation has some effect. And I'm going to contrast that today with some exploratory experiments, or experiments that are explicitly designed to discover some feature. And then what we're going to try to do in that same setup is to credibly estimate the effect, knowing about the potentially bad incentives from things like p-hacking and exploration normally associated with experiments. All right. So what's the target then? The target in this, in this setup that I'm going to talk to you about today is going to be both discovering treatments, discovering interventions, discovering features of the text, and then credibly estimating their effect. To do this, we're going to have a two, part, two sets of tools. The first tool is going to be an experimental design. It's going to look a little odd. In fact, it's going to violate intuitions or rules that you have in your head about how you can run an experiment. And then I'm also going to talk to you about a statistical method that enables us to discover these features. Uh, in particular, what I'm going to show is a um, uh, research design that would assign every participant in your study their own distinct text. Right, so there's going to be no overlap on the, ex on the, the intervention. Okay, so everybody's going to get their own distinct text. And then based on that, we're going to infer some latent treatments. And what we're going to be able to show is that even though we're just randomizing the text, we're actually going to be able to identify those latent treatments, of course, under a set of conditions. And then we're going to use a statistical method based on this research design that's going to enable us to infer the uh, underlying treatments 
and then estimate their effect. And we're going to do this credibly. We're not going to subject ourselves to things like p-hacking or exploration as long as you follow our procedure. We can make no guarantees on what nefarious researchers do after they get the tool, though. Okay. Um, and the, again, the running example is going to be ab about a response to congressional biographies. And what I'm going to show you is that even though we have what I think is a fairly counterintuitive setup, we're going to retrieve what I would take to be some intuitive features of these biographies. What I'll show you is that people don't like lawyers, okay? so that's maybe some good confirmation, and that there's a bonus from serving in the military. People also like education. All right. So how might we do this? Say we're interested, again, in assessing the features of candidate biographies that lead voters to like or dislike candidates more. So here's an example of a candidate biography that actually appears on our data set. This is from Wikipedia. We grabbed all of the congressional biographies off of uh, Wikipedia. And so this particular uh, person once got to drive the Wienermobile. It's quite distinctive. In fact, it's current Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Uh, his congressional biography, it looks something like this. Okay, so what might we do? We might look at this and say, okay, I think from this I can figure out what makes Paul Ryan tick or not tick and what makes voters like him or not. So the first thing we might do is we might include some explicit manipulation. And indeed, indeed, this is exactly the kind of manipulation we would do before. So in his current biography, there's claims that he read Hayek and von Mises and Friedman when he was in college. So we could replace that and suppose he went to Berkeley and he could read Marx and Zinn and Chomsky. Okay, and so this is fine, and you can identify the effect of making this sort of intervention. But it supposes you know the treatments beforehand. You know exactly what you want to manipulate beforehand. And again, that's fine, but that's exactly the problem we're trying to avoid. So here's another setup. What we could suppose is that instead of, uh, we're going to vary these blocks, I'm going to decompose these uh, speeches into a big document term matrix. So I'll make some sort of assumption about being able to suppose that we just have a bag of words here, or maybe some like pairs of words. And I'll just think about the effect of a particular word being there or not. So for example, I might suppose what happens if we don't include economics there, and we could just delete it here, and we just have majored in political science rather than economics and political science. But then there's another problem. It's unclear, at least to me, what it means to vary that, subs uh, that single word. What does it mean to drop this single word here? Perhaps this is a case where it can make a little bit of sense because of economics. But in other instances, it becomes less clear. Because when we think about language treatments, we usually think about a bundle of words, some sort of theme being there or not. All right. So you may think also that this is perhaps a known problem. We could solve this using some tool like supervised LDA. We could have some response, which would be the thing that we get from uh, our, our experiment participants. And then we could look at the topics that come out of that. And so we might get topics that look something like this with education and family and occupation. But there is a problem with models like LDA. And that problem is that the proportions that come out of this sort of model, they're going to live in the simplex, of course, their proportions, which means that we can't estimate the marginal effect of any one component. The only treatments that will be there are the entire vector of treatments. And so we're often interested in these settings of knowing if I isolated this one component and averaging over all the other conditions, what's that effect? And you're unable to do that here. And so we could do something unsupervised then, some sort of other latent factor approach, like principal component analysis or factor analysis, or uh, some non-parametric version of these. Um, but any one of these unsupervised methods are going to fail to take into account the response. And the result will be that we're not going to be able to uncover a treatment that's going to be related to the response. We're not going to be able to engage in that prediction. So what we're going to try to do then is we're going to try to have a setup that's going to allow us to automatically discover treatments, building on insights from the machine learning uh, literature, and then obtain marginal component specific effects. All right. So how are we going to do this? So here's our setup. And then we're going to show you that, uh, at least theoretically, that this should work. And then I'll give you the example. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a collection of texts. And we'll take these texts, and we're going to randomly assign them to individuals. Right. And in particular, at the moment, just in your head, think that every individual is going to get their own congressional biography. There's going to be no overlap on the biography obtained by the individuals. We'll then obtain some sort of response from those individuals. Here we'll suppose that we just ask folks on a scale of 0 to 100, how much do you like this candidate? So suppose you're uh, some sort of uh, political party and you're just trying to assess the viability of candidates. It's not crazy to think you might do this to figure out what's the sort of background or perhaps the optimal background that would be best. Then, given these texts and responses, we're going to divide our observations into a training and a test set. 
in the training set, we're going to apply a method uh, that we call the supervised Indian buffet process, because we take the Indian buffet process, which is an existing statistical procedure, and we add a supervision component to it. And this is going to allow us to infer the latent treatments that are present in the text. And in order to come up with a final model that we like, the one that's going to help us to infer the latent treatments, we use the non-parametrics associated with the uh, Indian buffet process, along with measures of quantitative fit. And there's going to be some qualitative model selection here. We're going to engage in full-on exploration at this stage because we're going to have it completely distinct from the effect estimation stage. Once we have a model that we like, we're going to pick it up. And in the test set, we're going to use this model to infer the latent treatments without taking into account the responses to make sure that we're not uh, uh, engaging in any sort of double counting. And then we're going to estimate the effects of, of the discovered treatments with a regression, where we also include a bootstrapping stage to in, ensure that we're including both estimation uncertainty and uncertainty that comes from our particular sample size. All right, so to give a sense for why this might work, there's going to be two things we need to know, both a sort of framework for seeing that, that this is like not just completely insane, and then a method for discovering the treatments. So what's our framework? So we're going to suppose that we have these collection of texts. We're going to pre-process them, pre them like often happens in the uh, Texas data literature. So we're going to toss out word order, for example. And what we're left with is a document term matrix. And then we'll standardize that. And what we're going to suppose is that for each observation, that the response depends upon the particular uh, vector of, of text that's received. All right. And what we're also going to suppose is that there's some function g that's going to map from those texts into a lower dimensional space. And so we can think about these as our treatments. If you're ever running an experiment where you're manipulating text, like a survey experiment, you are imposing this function yourself, basically. Right? You're saying that there's these, this like much bigger set of text. I'm imposing this particular set of things, and I'm going to make an assumption about the particular treatments that are present. And then we'll suppose that there's the other related uh, potential outcome, and that's going to be individual I's response to this treatment. We'll call that YITJ. All right, so we need to make four assumptions in order for this to work. So here are those four assumptions. The first is we're going to make a fairly standard no spillover assumption. We're going to suppose that everyone's treatment status only depends on their own treatment status. The second assumption is a, perhaps a bit more controversial. We're going to suppose that when we make this distillation, when we take our big vector of text and we drill it down or map it down to this latent feature, latent treatments, that that captures the, all the way in which the text would affect the response. Okay, you can imagine that's violated if our latent, if our mapping fails to take into account some features. The third component, we're going to suppose that we've randomly assigned our text. And the fourth motivates our uh, giving everyone their own treatment. The fourth says that there's a non-zero probability of all the treatments, of the latent treatments. Okay. And so if we have these four things, we can think about our key quantity of interest, which is the effect of any one component of this vector uh, being turned on minus, sorry, the average response when it's turned on minus the average response when it's turned off, or the effect of this one component. And what we can show is that even though we're just randomizing the text and not these latent features. Under these set of assumptions, we're able to identify the effect of these latent features by randomizing those texts. So this research design is going to enable us to identify these features even though we're not explicitly randomizing them. So this gives us reason to believe that we can discover some useful, uh, um, useful interventions with this sort of setup. OK, so then the question is, given this design, how are we going to actually do this? And to do it, we're going to fit a model that's going to enable us to learn both the latent features and then how those latent features predict both the response and the text. So our idea is that we're going to suppose that treatment assignments for each uh, document and for each category are going to come from a Bernoulli distribution. And then conditional on those treatment assignments, we're going to suppose that there's some set of latent features that map into documents. And then we're going to suppose those same treatment assignments also explain an individual's response. So we're going to fit this big model using our, both the responses to the intervention and, uh, and the matrix, uh, the, the document term matrix. OK, so we're going to take this procedure. We're going to use it on candidate biographies. What does that look like? So um, retiring Senator Barbara Mikulski, you might be worried that if we delivered exactly her biography to someone, they would know both the text about um, what was in the biography, and perhaps they know something about her, and they have some strong affinity uh, for, say, Democratic senators from Maryland. Uh, 
And so what we did is we scrambled the names into in, using a plausible scrambling rule, which meant that we had to be relatively intelligent about it and not scramble names across, say, ethnic groups. Um, and then we delivered a biography that looked something like this, where we say Schumacher uh, was, was born in this town, your parents. So it's exactly like in Wikipedia, other than this name scramble. And our idea was that for every respondent in our survey, we're going to ask them to evaluate three congressional biographies. So the procedure is they're going to observe some text. We're going to elicit their response on a feeling thermometer. And then we're going to divide these responses into the training and test set. We do the training, apply our model on the training set. And then on the test set, we'll use it to infer the effects. Using our procedure, we end up selecting 10 total treatments. Um, and here are just some examples of what those treatments look like. So the first treatment here uh, is one about education. And then we see some about, say, uh, partisanship, service in the military. Not surprising, given that these are congressional biographies over the 20th century, and a lot of people were serving in World War II. And then a pretty clear law school biography. We can also then estimate their effect using our procedure. And so doing this, uh, again, this is a bootstrap that includes lots of different kinds of uncertainty. What do we see? So we see for treatment three, for example, that people like education. They also seem to like military service. These have positive responses. But then there's a negative response to uh, any, having any sort of partisan background and uh, any uh, background that has to do with law school. And so this is, I think, intuitive. People don't like politicians and people don't like lawyers. But it's perhaps less intuitive because the bulk of people who are in Congress have previous electoral experience and are, in fact, lawyers. Right? So whatever bonus, uh, or whatever uh, deficit they experience from being evaluated in this way, it must be compensated for in some other way. OK. So what does this procedure do? This procedure gives us something that's like an unsupervised conjoint for uh, discovering the effect of text on responses. So it enables us to discover things like discover treatments and then get valid estimates of their effects. There's lots of next steps in this procedure and lots of ways it could be applied more generally. So we ha haven't begun to think about really what like a power analysis would look like in this sort of setting, but it's ob of obvious importance. There's tons of ways to think about adding other latent features and to blend this sort of unsupervised approach with the supervised approach. But when we think about the applications of exactly this sort of procedure, we can think about this addressing many, many problems that persist in government and even outside of government, things like marketing, business, um, public health. So we might be interested in designing the optimal text uh, uh, treatment. And this procedure gives us a way to begin exploring that space perhaps a bit more completely than we would otherwise. So you can imagine running this procedure and selecting out the features that have the biggest response and recombining those messages in some ways. We could also think about applying this sort of procedure to other complex treatments. So for example, images are often used in the social sciences as a way to elicit a response. And yet we often vary one small feature of those images when there could be many, many other things going on. Exactly this same procedure could be used for images or videos, or if you're a political scientist, you might be interested in how a legislator's voting record affects um, the support they receive in the election, and also in observational settings, all in service of trying to better understand how speech can affect responses. Thank you. <laughs>